All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome aboard. This is our first, our first ever insights and in, insights over the lunch hour. It's kind of an opportunity to visit with the executive staff here at BHEC. Uh, my name is Daryl Spinks. I'm the executive director for the Texas Behavioral Health Executive Council. With me here today, I have all of uh, the board administrators and my executive level staff, or most of my executive level staff, uh, that that they're going to be participating in this webinar. We've got Miss. Uh, Christina DeLuna, she is the board administrator for the LPC board. We've got Ms. Sarah Fassholes, who is the board administrator for both the MFT and the social work board. And then we've got Ms. Diane Moore, who is the board administrator for the psychology board. Uh, also joining us are Tim Spear. He's our director of operations and kind of helps keep me out of trouble as best he can. And Patrick Hyde, who is our general counsel and keeps all of us out of, out of trouble and keeps us from eating cheese sandwiches uh, needlessly behind bars. So. Um, let me let me kind of talk to you about the format of what we're going to do here today because I'm, you know, there were like fifteen hundred people that signed up for this thing, which is way way more than what I had ever anticipated would be interested in talking to, uh, you know, a couple of government lawyers and <laughs> some board administrators. Uh, there was way more interest expressed than what I had anticipated. But the way I'm the way I'm kind of envisioning this going today is uh, both. All the board admins and myself will give about a 10 minute overview of each of our respective boards or council. Uh, just kind of give you a high level overview of you know, what's going on, what are the major issues that that particular uh, body is facing? Uh, what are some things that we see going on in the future? Maybe some possible issues that we see popping up in the future. Um, and then you know, we're just gonna rotate through that. I'll go first and then we'll, we'll be followed by Sarah and I think uh, Diane and then Christina will We'll pull up the tail and then of course uh tim and, and patrick are here to basically help me and, and help answer any questions anybody has but what i what i really envisioned when i when i came up with this was not so much you guys listening to us talk i wanted to give you all the opportunity to basically have a blank check and just ask us whatever you wanted to ask us about the agency now i mean we can't talk about pending app you know i, I don't want this to turn into a i certainly submitted this uh this item last week for my application have you gotten it we're, we're not going to do that kind of thing and we're not going to do the what's the status of my complaint you know I'm, we're not going to talk about those types of things here but uh you got questions about just what's going on in the profession you know rules what's well you know what you, you know what our understanding is is kind of the rationale behind rules or you know what's it like uh you know working with the boards or working within the council what's the rule making process overall those types of things, uh, I, I want y'all to feel free to ask us about. Really, nothing's off limits, uh, like I say, other than those two, those two items. I don't want to talk about uh, pending complaints, and I don't want to talk about pending applications. So, uh, but there's a whole world outside those two matters. So, I want y'all to feel free to ask us anything. Uh, we're here until three o'clock. At three o'clock, I've got a licensing meeting that I've got to be at. It's my I have a weekly standing meeting that I do with the licensing division tackle any issues that have come up on applications during the week so i gotta i gotta make that so that i don't hold folks up getting licensed but uh you've got us till then uh i'm gonna try to keep us our presentation uh and be out you know be done with our portion of it by one o'clock for sure and then give the remainder of that time to y'all to ask questions i've never been one to uh for lack of words so lord knows i could fill in three hours if if you wanted me to uh, I know Sarah has a hook ready to go to shut me up if I get out of line. So, um, but I think I think with that, uh, with that having been said, you know, I, I want to kind of get going. What, one of the things that I always let me give you a little bit about my background. I, I came as I started out as the general counsel for the psychology board back in 2011. I came from private practice. I, I'm an attorney, uh, and I was practice law for almost 10 years in the private sector came to the psychology board, served as the general counsel one year, moved into the executive director position. One of the things I always enjoyed uh, while serving as the ED for the psych board was the ability to interact with the licensee population. I like doing it at conventions, at, at you know, public presentations. I used to go speak at uh, local associations, you know, the local CLEs that the local area associations would put on. I always enjoyed that because it's an opportunity to kind of put a face to who, who it is that's here in the Austin in the office in Austin. And so I know BHEC is, is large. There's almost you know, 70,000 of you. So you don't have that same opportunity for that one-on-one that like I used to at Psych Board, but thanks to Zoom and you know, the, you know, the pandemic has got us all used to doing this stuff virtually. 
it's it's certainly better than nothing at all. I mean, I realize it's not as as, as good as you know pressing the flesh at a convention or something like that, but uh, it's still I think it's still a good opportunity uh, for all of us to kind of get to know one another and for y'all to ask questions. And I mean, I I'm not scared of the hard questions if anybody has hard questions or stuff. This is not going to be. I'm not expecting all softballs today, and you're not required to just ask softball questions. So, uh, by all means, I want everybody to feel free to ask us anything that they've got, uh, or just to air any grievances or anything like that. Um, I, basically, I want y'all to see the faces and hear the voices and kind of get to know the individuals that are shepherding the boards, if you will, through the administrative process of, of, of what they do, their functions of rulemaking, of, you know, vetting applicants, of conducting ISCs, the informal settlement conferences, of imposing disciplinary action. All of that stuff is, it's a, it's a very complicated dance, and it's, it's become even more complicated under BHEC because of the, the umbrella structure, but um, I, I just want y'all to kind of get to know those of us that are here shepherding those board members through that, and uh, just, I want also y'all to have an opportunity to hear from us about kind of what what we see is what it's like you know I can I can tell you, I've never served as a board member but I can certainly tell you uh what I observe of them you know the the struggles that they carry and the the weights you know the the issues that they face as board members uh so we're going to talk a little bit about that today now at the end of this webinar you're going to have an opportunity it's just a little two-question survey I would like it if all of you uh, if you if you if you stick around to to take that survey Basically, it just asks you, was this, you know, was this helpful? Would you recommend it to a colleague? This is the first time we've done this. I'm trying to figure out if this is actually going to be beneficial for y'all. Uh, if it's not, then I don't want to waste everybody's time. I don't want to waste my time, my staff's time, and your time doing this. And this will be the last time you see us on something like this. But if y'all like it, you enjoy it, you get something out of it, then, yeah, I mean, I, we're, we're definitely going to continue on with this stuff. Um, you know, hopefully someday I'd like to push maybe, you know, some of the board members into doing stuff like this, too, if we can keep them, from, you know, just wouldn't be able to have a quorum do it, but uh, have them do little little, little one off sessions uh, on, on particular topics. Um, that way y'all get a chance to interact with them as well. So uh, but that's <laughs> that's their time. I can't really volunteer that. We'll have to see how that goes. We'll see how many rocks y'all throw at us on this one. They may not want to do it after if this is bloody. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll see uh, how that goes, but that's kind of the mindset behind it. So if you don't mind, fill out that survey at the end of this presentation, that'll give me some idea of whether or not we, we should do something like this again in the end, or if y'all don't see any value in it. So what are the topics that, that I'm going to talk about, uh, here with you for BHEC? Cause uh, is the ED for BHEC, I'm going to talk about the council. I'm going to leave Christina, Sarah, and Diane to talk about the boards and then Tim, Patrick, Guy, and all of us will answer questions in the end. Um, the number one thing I want to talk about right out of the gate is the fingerprinting requirements. I know for those of you with psych board, you can kind of turn, you know, tune me out right now because you've already heard this presentation umpteen times. But for those of you that are coming over from the HHSC boards, you know, if you're renewing a license and you haven't been fingerprinted for BHEC, that's the key there, fingerprinted for BHEC. If you haven't been fingerprinted for BHEC, you've got to go get fingerprinted before we'll renew your license. So you're going to get those of you that are coming up for renewal either soon or at some point in the future, you're going to get on your renewal reminder postcard. And Sarah's got one right there that apparently it came back. Somebody gave us the wrong address. <laughs> um, you're going to get one of those postcards and that postcard will actually have the instructions on where you are to go on the web to download the instructions on how to do the digital fingerprints. Now you, you can also do a hard, a hard copy of your fingerprints. There's instructions uh, there as well that will teach you how to do that. But here's why I wanted to talk about this today. One, it's critically important that everybody make sure that we have your current, your most up-to-date address of record. And y'all have to, you're gonna have to excuse me. I'm, I'm not getting over the COVID. I'm just getting over some kind of crud, uh, cold or some sort. And it has been kicking my tail for the past couple of days, but um, so bear with me on that. But uh, th one of the important things we need y'all to do is I need y'all to make sure that you're keeping your address up to date in the system because we get a lot of those back uh, from folks that that you know they're not doing that they're not keeping their address up to date and you you cannot renew your license, ladies and gentlemen, until we we get those fingerprint uh, requirements back from DPS and the FBI. So. 
that's a hard stop uh, if you haven't done it. You, your license will go delinquent. Even if you paid, you've done everything else. If we don't have your fingerprints on file, it won't be renewed. Um, now, what I also do is if we have your email address in the database system, in addition to that postcard, I'm also sending out an email to folks, letting them know, hey, you know, this is the postcard you should be getting in, the, in a couple of days. Uh, if you don't, even if you don't, here's where you need to go to get your fingerprints, uh, or here's where you need to go to download the instructions and get your fingerprints done. So we're taking that approach. And of course, we've also got on our website, and I'm going to let Sarah show you here in a little bit. She's going to kind of give you a walk around on the website. Uh, we have a, a web page on each board uh page dedicated to the fingerprinting instructions i'll tell you it's the same for all the boards there's nothing different on the lpc board than on the social work board or psych board it's all the same um th this this little part of my presentation is really directed more at licensees than it is applicants because the applicants you're going to have to go through this to even get the license to begin with uh so it's a little different for y'all but licensees it, i know this is a new addition it's something a, a new requirement for renewal. So I wanted to put everybody on notice about that. Just make sure your address is up to date. Uh, if you haven't provided us with your email, go ahead and do that. And by the way, when you provide us with your email, it, you, you actually need to do it in the database system. Just signing up for our email list doesn't add your email address to the database. I, I know that's kind of, it's kind of confusing. You'd think, well, I gave it to you in one spot. Why don't you have it in the other? That's because we use eye contact to send out the email list, which is not tied into our database. Our IT folks would have an absolute conniption fit if I tried to do that. Uh, they're not going to let that happen for security reasons. But um, So just make sure that we have your correct email address in the database. And uh, th that, that way, if, you know, if I have to, if I, when I'm sending out my email reminders to folks, and it's usually about two to, I don't know, two to 2,800 people is what the emails go out to. That way you'll get the email in addition to the postcard reminder. Now you may be asking, well, Sphinx, why don't you just put that uh, link on the website, you chucklehead, and, and you would be able to avoid a lot of work. Well, I did that at Psych Board and I got in trouble with the FBI. Not only did I get in trouble with the FBI, I got the Department of Public Safety uh, in trouble with the FBI. So uh, the feds didn't like that and they fussed, they didn't really fuss at me, but they fussed at DPS quite a bit. And so DPS politely asked us to take it down. I mean, it, I don't know. I know some of you are bound to be employed by the federal government, um, but it's, you know, it's the feds. What can I say? <laughs> what can I say? I'm sure some of y'all feel the same way about us, but uh, it's just, that's one of the requirements they have. They don't want that stuff floating around out in the ether. And so they have told us you can only provide it to people who are actually applicants or licensees. Nobody else should have access to it. I had originally put it out there, you know, for folks to do ahead of even applying. And the feds were like, no, you cannot do that because they have no connection to you whatsoever whenever they do it. So you have no authority to subscribe to them. You have to wait until they actually apply or a license with you. That's, that's where their gripe comes in. Uh, and it, it's honestly, I make a jest about it, but it's actually a legitimate gripe. I understand what they're talking about there. Uh, but if you're wondering why we don't do that kind of proactively, that's why. Uh, the, the FBI does not want that stuff floating around out there because they don't want just willy-nilly anybody undergoing this particular type of criminal history background check because when you do it it shows up in this it, it's in a queue uh, I don't know I can't remember where it's called or where it's housed but it's in a queue somewhere that people could subscribe to and that's not a good idea from a security standpoint so uh, that's why we don't do the fingerprinting now the rulemaking process I want to talk a little bit about that. I know, I know everybody's used to how things used to work under their under their boards, under their respective boards. Uh, somebody would would come up with an idea. A board member would take up that idea. They would propose, you know, have staff or have attorneys draft the change. The change would get debated and discussed either in committee or at a meeting. It would then get proposed, sent over to the Texas Register. Comments come in. Those comments come back to the board. The board then decides whether to adopt the rule as is or make changes based upon comments or to just abandon the effort altogether. It's quite a bit different now. Um, <clears throat> what, I, I'm, what I'm gonna do here is, um, Tim has come up with a really good flowchart to explain the rulemaking process under BHEC. 
And I'm going to turn on the chat function for just a minute. And I'm going to distribute a copy of that, that, uh, that chart to all of you. It should go out to everybody. So um, hang tight with me for just a second here. I'm going to see if, see if I can do this. Should be able to. Yep. OK. Everybody should be able to, in the chat box, you should be able to see the, the rule process map. It's a Word document. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't think to convert it into a PDF, so I apologize. Um, if anybody needs a PDF, just go to the Contact Us webpage on BHEX website. Just email the admin executive leadership, just saying, hey, I need a PDF of this, not a Word. I can't open Word, and I'll shoot it to you. Um, but this does a really good job of explaining the rulemaking process. It is the dance has become incredibly more intricate and complex now. In short, um, everything that deals with scope of practice, standard of care, continuing education, schedule of sanctions, those things still have to originate with your member board. When I say a member board, I'm talking about the board that issued your license. Um, now, anything else like that deals with the licensing or the uh, the, the licensing application complaint and investigation enforcement type process, BHEC handles that rule. Those rules can originate at BHEC. Uh, so that, that's the big distinction. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example. This is the example I use all the time. Let's say that uh, Diane has a, uh, a board member that says, we don't think right now her folks have to do 40 hours of continuing education every renewal cycle. Let's say they're like, that's not enough. Our folks need to double it to 80. Well, the council can't just double that. So the, the psychology board members who sit on the council couldn't at a council meeting propose that kind of a rule change. That kind of a rule change has to come up before Diane's board first. That board would have to vote on that change. Uh, then from there, and of course, they could do any kind of informal rulemaking or informal stakeholder input they wanted. They could have a town hall meeting. They could publish it, uh, not in the Texas Register, but on the web page for comment, send it out you know, however they wanted to. Uh, they got free reign to do that. But after that, they would then send it up to the council. And the council would look at it and go, okay, the council's only job when it gets a rule from a member board is, is a three-step analysis. One, is that rule change anti-competitive? Uh, is it administratively consistent with your legislative authority? And is it, uh, does it violate any kind of good governance concerns? Um, I see some people in the chat I didn't send a PDF. I sent out a Word document. Uh, you just have to download it from there. And like I say, if you can't open that or you can't access it, just go to the BHEC Contact Us webpage, email the admin or executive leadership, and say you need the PDF of that, and I'll send it to you after the presentation. But back to the rulemaking. So it gets up to the council. They're going to look at those three things. Now, there, there's a whole lot that goes into that first one. Is it anti-competitive? There's a pretty significant analysis that has to take place that Patrick and Tim and I have to work through in making that. Really, that kind of an analysis ought to happen down at the board level as well, because it's it's what you don't want to do is get in the business of sending stuff up to the council that you know is a is a loser idea or that is anti-competitive and is never going to make it through the process to begin with, because it's just going to get shot down. Uh, that has not happened very often. In fact, I can count on one one hand with some fingers left over the number of times that something went up and was sent back down uh, by the council. Um, but it's nevertheless, that's the process that has to go through. Now, once the council uh, agrees to propose that rule, it, it has to go to the governor's office at that point for what we call the budget and policy division or the informal rule review. And really rule review at that stage is kind of a misnomer. Really what we're talking about there is they're looking at it to see it, is the way you have it structured, is it a good idea? Uh, does it actually help you with administrative efficiency? They also help with the wording. Because one of the things you want that I think a lot of agencies struggle with is consistency in how you structure the language of a rule. There is a whole dedicated set army of lawyers that are dedicated to writing statutes. It's, it's a language in and of itself. And a lot of that, we try to use a lot of that same type of language and, and methodology in rule writing, but it, I'm not well versed in it. I'm, I'm fairly good in it, but I certainly don't speak it, speak it perfectly or write it perfectly. And so the governor's office helps us with that a lot. Uh, but they also help us with uh, just issues that 
in all honesty, it's, it's not a bad idea to have multiple sets of eyes on something like this. When you're affecting policy that affects all 254 counties, 30 something million people in the state of Texas, it never hurts to have a few set of extra eyes look over something. Uh, what you don't want to do is have some goofy typo make it through, which we've had, I've done. Uh, you know, I can't, I, I'm, not, I'm not casting any aspersions here. I've done all the stupid stuff uh that that you know probably the governor's office would have caught had that been instituted you know long long ago but that's what they do they don't really at that point go it's not like the old roman emperor you know thumbs up thumbs down that's not what they do uh, but they kind of give you their input and then um you take that sometimes you have to really they'll tell you you know look you got a serious problem with this rule did you ever think about how you know, this statute comes into play over here and it, it may give you a real serious pause where you have to go back and go to the board and go, look, I don't think this is such a great idea after all, guys. Uh, but most of the time, it's, it's, it's very, you know, benign type stuff. It's easy to deal with. Okay, so once they clear it, it's, it's now in the Texas Register. Now, if this is a rule like, well, we were talking about adjusting the CE upward, that's going to have, on its face, that's going to have an anti-competitive impact because that's going to require you to do more to keep your license it's, require, it's going to require you to expend more money in order to keep your license. So that in and of itself, it adds cost to the consumer and it makes it more difficult to keep and maintain your license. So that kind of a rule is then going to have to go to the regulatory compliance division, a separate distinct division within the governor's office whose sole function is to review rules for uh, antitrust concerns. They, they, are, they are basically doing uh, the same or a very similar thing to what the council does, except they are a neutral and detached party. They, they, you know, the council is made up of two members from each board and then a public chair appointed by the governor. The governor's office, that is a person appointed by the governor, confirmed by the Senate. And uh, I happen to know the young lady, that, I mean, Aaron Bennett is her name and Aaron and Julie Davis. Uh, Julie was, worked for, Julie Davis is one of the attorneys that works for Aaron. Uh, both of them are <laughs> very sharp ladies. Uh, if they tell you that there's a problem, then there's a problem. I mean, they're, they're, they didn't get to where they are because they're dummies. Um, and so they're going to be the ones that are conducting the rule review up there. And they're not there to say, they're not there to pass judgment and go, wow, that's a bad idea. Or that's a dumb idea. The only thing they're looking at, or they don't even, they're not even going to tell you, yeah, that's a great idea. The only thing they're looking at really is, hey, is this going to affect negatively affect market competition? Are you going to hinder the ability of providers to come into the marketplace and i.e. expand our number of providers uh, for care in the state? That type of thing. I can already see I have gone way over my 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to hustle up. Um, I hear no objections from Christina, Sarah, and Diane, though. So, uh, so let's say, they, let's say uh, Sarah, I mean, not Sarah, but um, Aaron and Julie uh, clear it. I ought to just say, the regulatory compliance division I'm not speaking first names like that but let's say the regulatory compliance division clears it it comes it then comes back you know it, we collect public comments we take everything we then ship all that back to the member board that originated the rule so it would go back to the psych board and we would tell them look here's all the comments we got here's all the hate mail we received on your idea to increase continuing education do you still want to do it and then the board they have to have an internal debate amongst themselves. And of course, everybody gets to comment again. You can show up at that meeting and comment and tell them you like it, you don't like it, you know, whatever. Um, then they will decide whether to give a recommendation to the council to adopt or withdraw it. Uh, or they can adopt, they can say, well, adopt it but with these changes. Then that comes back up to the council. At that level, everybody gets to comment again. You all get to come in and give public comment. When it's all said and done, folks, you get about five or six opportunities to comment on a single rule here, whereas before you really only got two. One at the meeting where it was proposed, and then one, you know, I guess during the, I guess three, uh, during the publication, and then at the adoption meeting. But here you get a couple more bites at the apple. So you actually get more opportunity to, for public input here. That's the life cycle. And, and Tim's uh, spreadsheet does a much better job of, uh, of explaining this than what I have probably done here, but I just wanted to give you all an example of how the rulemaking works. Now, uh, moving on to some other things that we're working on in BHEC, telephone customer service improvement. I know this is a, um, it's a, I know, I know it's a pet peeve of everybody being able to get a hold of folks here. I will say this, I think it has gotten better. We've been trying to tackle this at the past couple of board meet or council meetings. 
Um, I think it's gotten better. Initially, when we had launched, we had uh, well, we had two receptions. Then we lost one. We, we operated off one receptionist for a long time. We are now back up to two. Um, I'm actually, I've got, you know, there, there's only so much we can do. You, there, there's an old saying attributed to Teddy Roosevelt. He, he basically said, you do what you can with what you have where you're at. And that's what we're doing. Uh, I realize what we're doing is not ideal uh, because Lord knows I don't like talking to a machine or sitting on hold. It just ticks me off as well. But what I also don't want to do is set up some kind of a phone tree system where you're punching in 9,000 different numbers to try to get to the right spot, and it doesn't, and it just pisses you off, uh, uh, you know, or, or sends you down some rabbit trail that you can never get out of, or you, you leave voicemails, you know, uh, and the, the problem with leaving voicemails is, is I found early on when we launched BHEC, I, I turned that system on where people, if you couldn't get through, you could leave a voicemail that was so highly abused and it became so, it got so out of hand so quickly, I had to shut it down. It was actually completely overwhelming us. We had like 200 voicemails within an hour uh, of, of turning that system on. And I mean, it got just completely out of hand. So we actually had to turn that off. But I will tell you this, since the last council meeting, well, the council meeting on Tuesday, I've actually, I visited with one staff member and I've got one other idea that we may be able to that may be able to take some of the pressure off the phone system. I'm not ready to announce what it is here because I don't want to get anybody's hopes up. I don't want everybody going, well, what happened to that idea you mentioned with the, the insights uh, lunch hour presentation. But uh, that, that I'll just, I just want everybody to know that is something we're all well aware of. We're right there with you. Nobody here likes that. Uh, I would much rather be able to pick up the phone and talk to you and answer your question than to have to, you know, read 10,000 emails a day and, and respond. But um, it, it is, it's just where we are. And, you know, we've only got an X number of warm bodies that we can throw at it. The more warm bodies we throw at the phone, the less warm bodies we have processing applications and complaints. It's that simple. It's a zero sum game. Uh, some, a couple other things I won't go over a lot of detail with you is the fee review advisory committee. I'm going to show you that committee has actually made a recommendation to the board. I'm going to share with you what that recommendation was. You can get a copy of the actual spreadsheet that we used. Uh, or PDF version of it in the board materials from the October 26th council meeting. I'm going to share with you the actual spreadsheet that the committee used when it when it came up with its recommendation, though. So you can actually play around with this spreadsheet, and just kind of see, hey, if we change these numbers, what what kind of revenue would it generate? Uh, let me if I can find that here. Yeah, here we go. Okay, I just uploaded the in the chat. You should all have access to that fee calculator uh, spreadsheet. The I, I can tell you what the the committee's recommendation was uh, to go with. It's the column that says it's the lesser of our current fee or the seventy five percent of the national average fee. So. Uh, I think it's highlighted on there, but I just wanted y'all to, to have that. You, what I would encourage you to do is actually go back and watch the October 26th council meeting to kind of get a good idea of what that means. I don't have time to explain it all here, but that spreadsheet is the culmination of a lot of work by the committee. And that was a committee that was not made up of just the council, but was made up of all kinds of stakeholders. Uh, the standardization committee, right now, the big thing the standardization committee is working on, and that, that's a committee we put together to try to figure out what aspects of regulation between the boards can we standardize? Uh, and then if we can, once we've identified those, what should that standardization look like? Continuing education is an area that we've identified as something that could probably be standardized or pretty close to it. And so we're actually working on what that standardization language would look like right now. Another thing we're working on and the council has just approved is a workforce study. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time. We don't really have any good data on workforce uh, participation and, and all that information. So I got a, I had a couple of stakeholders help me draft it based upon some social work, psychology, and other uh, workforce studies that, that, that I had access to. Uh, I'm now going to be reaching out to the state associations to get their input on that. 
and then I will take that feedback back to the council. We'll make some tweaks, and I suspect we'll publish that for public comment before we actually deploy that workforce study. And the last thing I want to visit with you about is uh, federal litigation uh, that could impact the profession. And I, I'm this is always I think people get scared of this, and I mean to some degree you should be a little scared of it. You need to you need to be aware of what's going on out there. Uh, because my profession can certainly impact your profession. Um, we've got the Fulton versus City of Philadelphia case, which was a U.S. Supreme Court case that came down just not too long ago. Uh, it dealt with a, um, the, the City of Philadelphia was telling a Catholic adoption charity that they had to consider, uh, uh, they had to certify same-sex couples. The adoption, Catholic adoption charity was like, no, we don't. Uh, that's, that's contrary to our religious beliefs and so long story short it was a case that went all the way to the SCOTUS and the SCOTUS said yeah uh, while the days of discrimination against the LGBT community are probably over for the most part or they should be uh, anytime anything bumps up against the first amendment though the right of uh, expression of your religion whatever that thing is it's going to lose the first amendment wins and so long story short the the, the Catholic adoption charity was not required to uh, recognize same-sex couples in doing their, their adoption certifications. Now, what does that mean to, to us? It, it just means that uh, while some of the boards, like the Social Work Board, for example, has some rules that talk about uh, non-discrimination against you know, sexual orientation, sexual you know, gender identity, that kind of thing, those are still valid rules. But in the event someone, uh, you know, in the event someone is claiming a religious exemption from that requirement, then that's something we're going to have to respect because they have the First Amendment right to express the religion, not just believe it, but express it and live it. So that that's something we, you know, that's something we all need to know about. Auto versus the, the next two are auto versus the city of Boca Raton and pickup versus Brown. The pickup versus Brown is actually an older case out of the Ninth Circuit. And what those two cases talk about, why they're important is, is the pickup case says that uh, conversion therapy is not a form of speech, but a form of conduct. Whereas the auto versus city of Boca Raton says, no, conversion therapy is not conduct. It's actually speech. And therefore, uh, the, the, the city of Boca Raton had passed an ordinance saying MFTs cannot, um, cannot conduct conversion therapy. And, you know, if, if something is speech, then again, it falls under that First Amendment protection. And, is, you know, the First Amendment is going to trump. So, You've got some competing uh, case law there between the 11th and the 9th Circuit. That the 9th Circuit case is not going where it's final. It never did make it to the Supremes, I don't think. The auto versus city of Boca Raton, though, that one is still, an, is still ongoing, I believe. So there could be a, some potential for a SCOTUS opinion there. That would give us some direction on whether uh, conversion therapy and, and really whether the practice of your professions is considered more speech or more conduct which that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, that is a very big deal. I, I know it doesn't sound like it, but that is a, that, that's a very important point. So I'm watching those pretty closely. Brokamp versus Washington, D.C., that is an LPC case that deals with interstate practice. Uh, we're watching that. And then a recent one that was just filed is Hunter versus U.S. Department of Education. That deals with a challenge to uh, private schools accepting federal student aid money or federal student loan money and whether or not they can do that while also, uh, you know, having certain religious requirements, in other words, not accepting uh, organizations or student organizations or policies or practices that, are, that contravene their religious, their underlying religious covenants and beliefs. So the reason I brought that up to the council at the last meeting was because if that if that is challenged and they are successful, then there could be some private universities that are knocked out of the the pipeline to produce providers that send to us for licensure. So that's kind of an important point. I try to watch that type of stuff. So that's all I have for right now. Lord knows that's enough. Uh, I've gone way over my limit here. I'm going to turn it over to, is it Sarah? Are you up? I'm up. All right, take it away. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully provide you with some uh, helpful information from our uh, web page at www.bheck.texas.gov. Um, it lists the four member boards in the right-hand corner. Each of these has a link. Uh, I'm Sarah Fossils. I'm the board administrator for the Texas State Board of Social Worker Examiners and for the 
Marriage and Family Therapist Board. So each link is specific to that particular board. I'm gonna go back to the homepage for the Executive Council and kind of start at the bottom. As Daryl mentioned, we do have some difficulty with the resources dedicated to phone contact, but we do have this email web form. If you would email us here, select the particular profession or the uh, particular inquiry con uh, uh, that you have, make sure that you provide an email address so we can respond to you, type in the particulars of your message, and I do want to point out at the bottom, there's an upload feature. So if you completed your online application or your uh, renewal form, but forgot to submit that jurisprudence exam certificate, for example, you can go to this contact us page, launch the email thing, uh, upload that form, and, and then go ahead and submit that. And then it will be directed then to the appropriate, um, appropriate staff member. And then I also want to bring to your attention, some things cannot be uploaded uh, by the applicant or by the, um, by the renewal person, if, if the licensee, if they need to renew it. Some things have to come from a primary source. For example, official transcripts need to be emailed from your school to, uh, to this transcript email. We can accept that. And also a certified self-query report from the National Practitioner Data Bank. Can, uh, when you receive that certified email from the, NAT, the NPDB, don't open it, just forward it to this email and that certification should remain intact and we should be able to accept it that way. If you open it, um, then it might become invalid. So we just wanna make sure that, um, that, you, that you know about that. Otherwise, if you received that by mail, you can still keep it in the unopened, uh, envelope that's sealed by the NPDB and mail that to us um, as you have been doing in the past. Uh, let's see. So then I just want to work my way up. Uh, email updates for those of you who are on this meeting. Um, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but if you want to know what's going on periodically with the board, we do send these email notices out. You'll complete this form and submit that. You'll get a I email back to confirm the subscription. So just follow those prompts to get that to get that going. Um, if you want to know what's going on with statutes and with rules, we have a web page for that. And want to highlight here the consolidated rule books. These are searchable PDFs, so they're easily convenient. Um, one of the changes with going to BHEC is suddenly, for example, a marriage and family therapist not only has to pay attention to chapter 801, but now has to pay attention to chapter 881 to 885, as well as 801. So we've consolidated those for you so you can search through all of those rules and know what's, what's current. Um, so shortly after a rule is adopted, um, staff is able to update these rule books. And so you're, you can stay pretty up to date with that. One and two, let's see. If you've submitted an application or you submitted your renewal while you're in the online, let me back up to that one. So you know that you need to renew online, everyone, and that's one of the new rules. You'll go to this system to renew online and you'll get that agency code for your fingerprint. I also wanna to bring to your attention, we've provided down here further on the page, everyone, um, a health, each healthcare practitioner is required to complete human trafficking course before their renewal. So we have a link here on our page to help you find the appropriate courses. You would go to the online renewal system here to launch that, do your renewal process, get the agency code, go get your fingerprint done. And then when you wanna check on whether that's done, go here to the verify a license or check license status that will show you if staff has completed it. If you have any questions about the fingerprint process, we have that on our fingerprint information page. I also wanted to bring out a, a really helpful resource is our how to user guides page. So if you don't need, can't remember what all I just told you about the renewal process and you want more details about what specifically is in the online process as you're going stepping through it. We have these uh, renewal guides and it steps you through the process with screen captures. And we have a, an abundance of 
helpful guides for each process that you might need to do, for example, um, how to change your address um, or how to create an account if you're a brand new user, that kind of thing. So that how-to user guide is a really good place to visit. Please note that renewal cards, after you've completed your renewal, you will not receive a renewal card or a re renewal permit. Um, those were discontinued last November. So if you need one, for example, if you're a supervisor and your associates need to provide a copy of your renewal card with their agreement form, there's a how-to guide on how to request that for a small fee. Um, so I think that's a pretty good basic tour of the website. Wanted to go back to some specifics about the social work board. Each of our member boards have a, a pretty basic template of quick links on the right hand side. Um, with the social work board in particular, there's some board news um, about the current uh, rules that are out for public comment. There's uh, chapter 781 and uh, these are the sections and the and the specific topics for the social work rules that are out for public comment. Comments are due by 5 p.m. on October 31st. And then there's also some rules in chapters 882 and 884 and 885. And those comments are also due at 5 p.m. on October 31st. So you can click on the board news and click on the links in the Texas Register. We'll show you the language of the rule and then go ahead and follow these instructions to submit your comment. You, you'll know that new rules were effective September 19th. This is, um, rules concerning petition to rule make, application for foreign degrees and executive council fees. And that will be of course in our consolidated rule book, um, but it's here on the webpage too. You can click on those links and see what's coming on with that. The other thing that's out there is a rule in chapter 883. So that applies to all four of the member boards. Um, it was approved by the, adopted by the council on October 26th. So it, it was, staff is writing in that for submission to the uh, Texas Register. Um, and, and if it's submitted by, for example, noon on November 1st, uh, it would be published at the earliest in the November 12th edition of the Texas Register. And of course it doesn't become effective until 20 days after the date it's submitted. But you don't have to remember all that if you've used our email um, email updates, if you subscribe to our email updates, then we'll be prompting you along the way as those things happen. So you can stay informed and stay involved and engaged in that. Each of the member boards has a meeting date, agendas and minutes. Um, with the social work board, they've uh, voted to uh, cease writing minutes. Um, they'll just have a recording of, of the meeting on our YouTube channel and all boards are, are doing that. Um, but a rule change is required. So I'll continue to do minutes for the social work board at least through February 1st, which is the next opportunity for the council um, to review that, that rule recommendation from the board. For the marriage and family therapy board, those rules will continue, uh, sorry, those minutes, they've decided to keep written minutes um, so there'll be a recording on the YouTube channel and then also written minutes on this archive as we continue with that. Please know that the jurisprudence exam is specific to each member board. Each member board is independent, has its own set of rules and its own set of uh, regulations. So, so for example, if I go to the marriage and family therapy page for the jurisprudence exam, this exam does not satisfy professional counselor, social worker, or psychologist requirement for jurisprudence exam. So you'd go down here to launch that exam, take the exam. If you need any help from the vendor for technical assistance, then here's a link here for, for technical assistance. And also the vendor can provide you with an exam history should you need that. For example, if you need a record that you took the exam a couple months ago, but you can't find it. Um, for those of MFT associates who need to find a supervisor or for social workers, who need to find a supervisor, we have a list of supervisors here. It's a list of those who are currently supervisors in our database. It is not a list of only those who are accepting supervisees. So you do need to do some legwork finding the supervisor that's right for you and that is accepting supervisees. A couple of things for if you've applied for a license, 
and you've been looking at our chart, I just want to explain that. So for example, if I submitted an application on October 1st, and I received a deficiency notice for maybe my jurisprudence exam, my self-query from the National Practitioner Data Bank, and my fingerprint, then that's all that's tracked on here. Staff has made that initial review and sent a response out. So don't look here anymore for, wait a minute, how come, my, how come they're moving on to these applications on the 15th when mine was submitted on the 1st and mine's not done yet? This is not about being done in the process. This is about the first initial review. So if you need to find, if you wanna quickly verify whether staff has completed your license or your renewal, then you would check on this one, verify a license or verify a renewal. Another important thing that we've added on this timelines page is that the closer to the bottom, is we finished fiscal year 2021, and we now have minimum, maximum, and median and average timeframes in the number of days that it took staff to complete the application process. So this is, might help you for planning purposes on what you, what you might need to do. I spoke to a military service member yesterday who was trying to get his license um, before he deployed. And so I directed him to this to let him know how long it was going to take approximately to get that done and let him know that there were, for exam purposes, there are testing centers uh, for marriage and family therapists, at least, that are international. So he, that gave him a little more leeway to do with that. Um, speaking of military, we can expedite and, and by law we're required to expedite applications for certain military qualifications, but we do need to receive that form. And so each of the member boards has a forms and publications webpage. And on that forms and publications webpage is a military supplemental form. So complete that form, include the documents that are required about your military service or your spouse as a military or your status as a military spouse. And then send that in with your app or upload that with your application or send that in via the contact form. Specific to the social work board, Um, the Social Work Board is working on a compact um, through the Department of Defense and the Council on State Governments. Mr. Daryl Spinks uh, is, work, is part of our technical assistance group and is attending those meetings on behalf of the board and on the behalf of this effort. It is a long, it's a long project. It's, it's been going on since 2020. Um, and it needs to be enacted by the state legislatures. So the first time that Texas could even look at it, given if all of this gets followed out the way it's laid out here, would be at their January, when they launch their regular session in January of 2023. So that's a long and complicated process. On the marriage and family therapy side, there is discussion of a compact. At their last meeting on October 22nd, the board heard from former Chair Smotherman, who is president-elect for the AMFTRB board, and she was on there, the AMFTRB's mobility committee. She explained that AMFT, AMFTRB, um, which is the, well, those who know, know it, know it, um, talked about compacts, mobility, portability, and teletherapy. And they determined that at this time, a compact was not a single approach that they wanted to take. It, it costs, as she said, millions of dollars to uh, initiate that process and thousands of dollars to maintain it after it's, after it's set up. And she noted that many states have so few marriage and family therapist licensees, it wouldn't be feasible for them to uh, participate in a compact. So not closing the door on that, but they are continuing to look at multiple approaches, approaches for the, the problems and the hardships that the compact might solve. So that's, um, that will be on the January agenda for the, so, uh, for the Marriage and Family Therapy Board. Jumping back to, sorry for the jumping back and forth, jumping back to the, um, jumping, no, I'll stay, I'll stay with MFT. For the Marriage and Family Therapists, one other uh, rule that just became effective is this remedy for uh, incomplete license requirements. We've had a number of inquiries about uh, those who have been an associate during this COVID period 
and there's a rule that requires that no more than 500 direct hours provided by technology assisted services may apply toward licensure of the LMFT license. So this new rule allows staff to be authorized to look at some of those who may not have been able to satisfy the requirements due to the declared disaster. It's only for those that are that are hardships that are resulting from a declared disaster. Um, so wanted to let you know about that. If, if you're an associate that's been impacted by that, please do track all of your hours. Please submit only up to 500 hours on your verification form and submit a, a signed letter by your you and your supervisor attesting to uh, what hours may have exceeded that. And then staff will review it according to the current rules. And I think that will do it for my portion of the presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Sarah. My name is Diane Moore. I'm the board administrator for the psychology board. And what's going on in psychology is the council is launching a new online application module beginning November the 22nd for psychology applications for licensed psychological associate, licensed specialist in school psychology, and licensed psychologists. The council will accept paper applications through November 19th. Applications received on or after November 20th will be returned to the submitter. So keep that in mind um, if you're sending in applications. Also available beginning November 22nd will be the user guides that um, can be viewed on the council site of how to navigate through this new online licensing system. For licensed psychologists who are holding a provisional status, they are still required to submit a paper form of the request for licensure issuance once they have passed the EPPP and completed their supervised practice. Um, so this, that's, that would be a game changer It'll allow um, people to apply faster and get the applications and the forms to the council uh, for review a lot quicker than the paper mail. The board has two proposed rules published in the Texas Register that are still open for public comment. The rule 463.11 regarding supervised experience required for licensure as a psychologist. This rule will allow an applicant to petition the board regarding deficiencies in the applicant's supervised practice, keeping in mind that the applicant must have completed at least 1,500 hours of supervised experience in a formal internship, obtained a doctoral degree in psychology, completed at least 1,500 hours of supervised experience following conferral of a doctorate degree, obtained a passing score on the EPPP and on the jurisprudence exam. If the applicant does not meet the minimum requirements stated, then the applicant is not qualified to submit a petition outlined under this proposed amendment. Furthermore, the proposed rule does not allow the board to waive or modify any requirements that are required by federal law, state constitution, or statute, or council rules found in 22 TAC part 41. The second proposed rules is rule 465.13 regarding personal problems, conflicts, and dual relationships. The proposed language clarifies when a licensee excuse me, a licensee should withdraw from any professional or non-professional relationships that would likely harm or impair a licensee's objectivity. The board will continue to accept public comments on these two rules through October 31st, five o'clock Central Standard Time. The public comments will be reviewed by the Psychology Board at its upcoming meeting on November 4th, 2021 which is next Thursday. 
We'll also like to remind everyone to utilize the board's website to review publications and other forms to gain additional insights on guidelines for using social media, which provides useful tools and information for precautions using social media and psychology practice today. Another helpful guideline is the practice of telepsychology. The Texas Psychologist Licensing Act does not prohibit a Texas psychologist from providing telepsychology services to a patient physically located in Texas. All of the same rules and requirements apply as if the services were provided in person. There are only some additional considerations the licensee would need to consider, such as confidentiality, is the electronic service being used secure and HIPAA compliant? And are there any limitations to the services that the licensee can provide since the services are not being provided face-to-face? -face? As for patients outside of Texas, a Texas psychologist will need to check with that state or jurisdiction to see what is required for such a license, a license, temporary license, or a possible legal exemption. But we cannot answer those questions for you because we are not the regulation um, of those states or jurisdictions. Additionally, Texas psychologists can apply with SIPAC to receive authority to practice telepsychology services to patients in all the member states of the SIPAC. There are currently 27 enacted states in the SIPAC. You must apply directly with SIPAC to participate, to practice telepsychology and or conduct temporary in-person face-to-face practice in SIPAC member states. You can obtain additional information on the SIPAC by using the link under the Psychology Board's webpage. We have a link for SIPAC. And this concludes my portion of the session. Christina. Right. So I'm Christina DeLuna. Uh, I'm the board of administrator for the LPC board. Uh, so a few things that are going on related to rules, um, proposed rules is currently uh, that we have some going on until public comment going on until October uh, 31st. Uh, some of those are related to the term of independent practice. Um, another clarifies that the associate must practice under an LPC supervisor, but may be able to own their own business and accept direct uh, payments. Um, another requires a supervisor to maintain record of uh, acknowledging that the associate is self-employed if applicable. Um, also, another is that it um, clarifies that the liability of the LPC associate falls on both the supervisee and the supervisor, and that's that. This is a big one. Um, that lang proposed language states that the supervisor may only be subject to disciplinary action for violations related to practice of counseling committed. Uh, let's see, committed, but the LPC associate in which the supervisor knew or there was an oversight by the supervisor and they should have known about it. Um, those are just a couple quick ones related to the current proposed rules that are um, out there for public comment. Um, I know uh, Ms. Foshel did go over um, the board website. If you go to the LPC section um, and go to, let me see what it's called, board news. If you go to under board news, and let me just share the screen just to make sure I know we, we kind of running out of time, but I want to just make sure everyone knows where to go. So um, let's see. Okay, so when you go to the LPC uh, section, I'm, everyone can see my screen, correct? Okay, so uh, under LPC, you're going to go to board news. Under board news, this is where we list everything that's going on with the different rules. Um, again, if you click here on the Texas Register, it's going to take you directly to the Texas Register, and you can see in that current issue what rules were proposed by the board. It also clarifies here where, you know, for the call, the public comment, it's within 30 days, um, exactly where you need to send that public comment to. 
Um, so these are these are really important places. And again, if you're signed up for those email alerts, that again is on the main BHEC website and um, uh, email updates, you will get direct notice about these, um, you know, anything that's going on with the board. So uh, we highly suggest signing up for those email alerts because it'll save you a lot of time. Um, let's see here. Christina, were you trying to share screen? Because I, I don't oh, know. yes. I don't it didn't go. It didn't go. Yeah. Okay, let's see. You want to walk me through that real fast again? Yeah. Oh, sorry. You can click share. There hey. we go. Okay, so um, again, we go to the profession, the LPC board web page, okay, go to board news, the very top one, all this here um, shows everything that's going on with the board rules, uh, the set the very this current one here where it says Texas register the Texas register is where we post all those proposed rules you'll go to that current issue um, and you'll be able to see everything that's proposed and it'll be for other departments and agencies and whatnot so you need to look for um, you know the professional counselor language so you'll have to do a little bit of work on your own um, but it you know it's it's very helpful and again um, that call for public comment you have 30 days to submit that that public comment related to the proposed rules and this is the email address that you need to send it to. So as you know, sign up for those email alerts. Again, I'm going to go to the main BHEC website. Very bottom, it says email updates. It's the third one from the bottom, email updates. And, and just like Sarah showed you guys earlier, um, sign up. You can sign up for all the boards if you're interested. You can sign up for just some of the boards, um, you know, based on what type of license you have. Or maybe you're thinking about, you know, having multiple licenses. Uh, just sign up for those email alerts so you can stay in the know of everything that's going on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so again, those uh, uh, proposed language, the proposed language is out there, closes on the 31st. Go ahead and get the public comment sent in. Uh, the board will review, let me stop sharing. The board will review the um, public comment on the uh, November 12th meeting. Um, and so go ahead and uh, get that sent out. They'll review it at the November 12th meeting. Um, sign up for email alerts, and then you'll find, you know, have the direct link to get to the Zoom meeting. Um, on October 26th at the council, the last BHEC council meeting, uh, with the support of the LPC board chair, the council did kick back the proposed language to 681.83, which is related to the academic course content. Uh, this was a big one. So now what's going to happen is that language is going to go back to the LPC board. They're going to re-review it. It's going to allow for further discussion. Um, so, you know, at this time, that one's kind of on hold at this point. Um, I know Sarah, you know, hit a lot of the key points on the website. I just want to remind people again, use that contact us form. It's on every individual board web, uh, board web, board website now. Um, I know previously it was a little difficult to find, but we have that available now. Um, the all of the recorded meetings and Daryl, I believe this one meeting will be posted on the YouTube channel. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, we'll okay. put it on the YouTube channel. Okay, I know that was one of the questions that had come up a couple of times. So um, anybody who had to leave early or need to leave now, this will be available for you to go back and look at on the BHEC Council YouTube channel, which is very helpful to go back and look at. And it's for all of the boards and the council meetings. Um, let's see. Big thing that everyone already, you know, uh, hit on were, was to make sure your, your uh, email address is up to date. The fingerprinting, you know, we're trying to get that information out. The board, the, I'm sorry, BHEC has sent out three email blasts in the past 60 days prior to uh, your, re your expiration of your license and email goes out. 45 days, that blue card gets, e gets mailed to you. Um, so make sure your information is up to date. Uh, if, if you call us somehow and, and get through and, you know, if we, if some of us are still working from home, the best way for us to get a hold of you or the quickest way is through email. So make sure you have your email address there so that we can get that contact uh, and response to you. Uh, lastly, and I forgot to, to mention earlier, um, the LPC board is in favor of the counseling compact. At this point, you know, we're just waiting that 
hopefully at the next session, which is again in 2023, um, that it gets it gets picked up and gets sponsored by someone um, so we can get moving on that route. But the LPC board is in favor of that counseling compact. And that's all I have. All right, Patrick, Tim, is there anything y'all want to say before we open it up and we start taking uh, verbal comments, questions? You think we haven't covered? Y'all think we need to? Um, just letting people know that on the Q and A uh, button down at the bottom of the screen, Daryl and I have been feverishly try typing, trying to answer some of those. So if you submitted a question, check to see if we've answered it. Um, we've got a little over half of them answered, so we're trying to multitask as best we can. Do you want to read through those, or do we want to compile those and email those to people at the end? Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think. I don't know how I would get it to the folks. Um, okay. I don't know. I don't. I can look and see if if Zoom captures their email where I can then send something out as a post attendee type thing. I'm not sure. I don't know how to do that. I'll have to. I'll have to play with it and see. But I, I think what I'd like to do now. I mean, if there's if there's nothing else, I'd like to just open it up for folks. You know, raise your hand. We'll do just like we do in board meetings. We'll go down the list. Um, and y'all, y'all ask us questions. Miss Camp, Sheila Camp, can you hear me? You're I muted. I pressed Ms. the wrong. I pressed there the you wrong. Go. That fingered. Sorry about that. Not a problem. What's your question? I didn't have a question. Oh, you didn't. Okay. Well, you had you had your hand up there, and I <laughs> fat fingers. Sorry. <laughs> okay, not a problem. Let's see here, Miss Prado. Hi there. Thank you. Um, I accidentally entered the wrong social security during my fingerprinting. I contacted the the main number, um, and they weren't able to see if it was corrected. Is there a way for me to verify? Yeah, I think I actually answered your question in the Q&A. Um, what I, yeah, what I would do is go on the Contact Us webpage. You'll see a, when you click on that email form, one of the topics will be fingerprinting questions. Send your, send your question there. That goes directly to the staff member that handles the fingerprinting issues. She can answer you. Uh, she should be able to get you straightened out. Thank uh, you. Je Jennifer Gallagher is her name. She'll, she'll get you taken care of. Jennifer what, I'm sorry? Gallagher. Okay, thank you. You bet. Ms. Jackson? Uh, yes, I had asked a question, a couple of questions in the Q&A. Okay. Uh, and so one of the ones that uh, I think I'm a, uh, probably a little more concerned, well, I have two. Previously, when uh, you were beginning your internship as a LPC, we used to call it, I guess, LPCI or whatever. Um, there were restrictions that you could not um, count hours like from your um, paid job uh, toward your uh, internship hours, nor could you be supervised uh, during your work hours if that was your job position. And I've answered this one in q and I'm not now, sure. I looked, when I looked, I didn't see the, the answer. Go to the answered. So it should, yeah. when you click Q&A, it should have an answered. Okay, I, I looked a few minutes ago. I didn't see it. I'll look again. Okay, but the, in short, uh, no, there isn't any such restriction that I'm aware of. Um, now, if your job does not have a... Uh, LPC supervisor involved, mm -hmm. even though you wouldn't be able to. Um, but there isn't any restriction in regard to whether somebody's full-time job um, has any impact on on supervision. You know, if somebody's if you're working for an LPC supervisor as your full-time employment, we would definitely accept that. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and then I think the second question I had in Q and A, uh, I didn't see an answer to. I'll go back and check again, but it was in reference to combining uh, the LMSW, the LMFT, the LPCs, 
and the LCSWs, like, are we all allowed to do the same thing? Oh, that's a dangerous question. Yeah, <laughs> it is. But I'm, but I'm finding that that seems to be some trend in the job market, that when they say requirements, it's listing a lot of those together. I'm just candidly, there is, there's going to be a, a significant amount of overlap between, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know about overlap between the LMSW and the LCS and the, the MFT. I'm not so sure about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you probably would see a lot of overlap between the LCSW and the MFT. Um, and what LPC. E yeah. yeah, and LPC. What exactly each one can do that the other one cannot do? Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you, I don't know how to answer that as I sit here. Um, I, I know that, I, I just know that there is, I, I know the professions view themselves as being distinct from one another, but also know that there is a, there is an acknowledged large degree of overlap between the professions. Um, I don't really know how to answer that, to be honest with you. Okay. So def, uh, specifically uh, LCSW and a LMSW, like a master social worker versus clinical, there are restrictions, correct? Yeah, there's going to be. There is a difference between yeah. the two scopes of practice. As far as what they're authorized, as far as authorized services. Right. Correct. Okay. What, what I would encourage you to I... do, the, the rules okay. actually do a pretty good job of laying out what those scopes are mm -hmm. uh, in the social work rules. I'd really encourage you to kind of, to drill down in those rules. Uh, Tim, Sarah, where is it in the definitions portion? In particular, in section 781.302, the practice of social work outlines the scope of each license type and specialty recognition. Okay. I, I wouldn't limit myself to just reading that. You'll wanna read the definitions and then get a little more context reading the rest of the rules. I'd recommend going through the consolidated rule book, but especially 781.302, the practice of social work. 781.302. Okay. And that's in the consolidated? It, it is listed, a courtesy copy is there in the consolidated rule book. Mm -hmm. okay. The official copy is on the Secretary of State site. Got it. Thank you. Michelle, I'm going to butcher your last name if I try to say it. You now one? Yes. You said Did it perfectly. Yay. Oh, hey, yay for me. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple questions. Um, I have multiple licenses and uh, I live out of state. So this renewal for fingerprints, is it possible to get my do my fingerprints in the state I live and submit it or do I have to literally go to Texas? No, you don't need to come to Texas. Okay. Uh, Identigo has offices all over the country. All okay. Over the US. Oh, that's fabulous news. And then my second part of the fingerprint question is if we have multiple licenses, do I have to do it for each license or can I just put one in the system for the multiple? Just one, I just need it for the one. As, okay. long as, it's, as long as those are all BHEC licenses. If you have a license with another agency, you're going right. to have to be fingerprinted for that other agency. But yeah, I have two like licenses LMS for Texas. LPC, yeah. You only need to do one. Um, both of those questions are answered on the fingerprint FAQ on our website. Okay. Michelle, are, are both your licenses with us? With I have, I have two licenses with Texas and I have one license in Utah. So I understand there's difference. It's completely different. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think his question was, are both of your Texas licenses with BHEC? Yeah. Um, yeah. MFT and LPC. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you'll only need to do that once as well. So if like, for instance, if your B, if your LPC expires in 2021 and your MFT expires in 2022, once you get the 2021 fingerprint, that's going to cover both of your licenses because it's the agency BHEC itself that uh, has access to the record. So you won't have to repeat the fingerprint process for both licenses. Okay. And I have one more question about telehealth because primarily I just see everyone in Texas with telehealth. Mm -hmm. So um, 
One issue I've come across is college students. Their permanent address is in Texas. Some live out of state and come home sometimes. Um, so if they're in college and we're trying to see them, in, if they are out of state for school, we can't see them. We literally have to wait till they come home in their feet and do a session. Well, it, you got to understand that's not us restricting you. That's right. that other jurisdiction. Uh, because you are you are telecommuting into their sandbox, uh, right. they they have the right there. So, yeah, I just need everybody to understand that's not us saying you can't do it. It's that other jurisdiction. They may or may not allow you to do it. I really don't. Jurisdictions are all over the board on how this is how this is handled. Okay. Um, you, you would really need to contact them to find out. That's that's one of the reasons why I'm a big proponent of licensure compacts. Yes. Is because that eliminates this, whereas. A lot of people point to licensure by endorsement as a good right. solution. Well, that that helps me. That helps get people into Texas. Right. It doesn't help those of you know my folks here who have to go outside of state. Outside right. of state. So that's why I'm a big proponent of licensure compacts. Okay. Thank you. And that's all. Thank you very much. You bet. Ms. Ivy, do you have a question? Hi. Yes. Um, with informed consent for private practice, we have to have a custody of record for care or a custody of care for our records if something happens, like we die or get sick. Um, and I have poured over the notes and I may have missed it, but I've, I've, and I've asked supervisors, nobody can give me a straight answer on who that person has to be per like the board recommendations. Does it have to be somebody who holds an equivalent license to ours? Or can it be somebody who we sign a business associate agreement with? Like my brother has a degree in risk management. So he would be somebody I would trust with that, but he doesn't hold a license for counseling in any way. Um, let me let me ask, stop you for just a sake. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, this is more for my board admins. Do we have a rule that actually says they have to have the a records custodian? The LPC does? Mm -hmm. Okay, the are they, the, are, MFT has it as well? I'd have to check on social work, but yeah, MFT has one. I know psych okay. doesn't. Um, okay. D now, do, the, do those rules, I guess to answer her question, do they require uh, the, the custodian to be another licensee of like kind? No. Okay. Um, does that answer your question, Elizabeth? Yes, most definitely. Uh, like I said, I, I scanned through the notes and they just, I may have missed it. Um, it just was kind of unclear. And a couple of yeah. my supervisor friends said the same thing. They're like, oh. I don't know. And then I saw this meeting and I said, perfect. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Thank this you. This is, this is one of those issues where I actually get, you know, one or I usually get one or two emails a month on something like this where somebody has passed away and they're like, Hey, what do I do with my wife's record? She was a psychologist or she was a counselor. Can I throw them away? I'm like, dear God, no. Um, uh, you know, so th this is honestly, this is something we, we really need to work on a set of guidelines uh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, not maybe not so much a rule, but a set of guidelines because th this is something the standardization committee really needs to take a look at to get to get it the same across the board so that it's not different for the professions. I know Psych Board has nothing. I have a cheesy little thing that I send out uh, that's a it's kind of a best practices that I just put together myself. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem you get into here when you start doing rulemaking is you start you start stepping on the toes of probate and state law. So it gets really, really tricky uh, there as to what you can do and what you can't do. So that, that's why it's, I've always kind of leaned more towards we need a set of guidelines rather than a set of rules. But um, I, hey, I learned something new today too. I didn't realize LPC and MFT had a rule on that. So to clarify, social work does as well. Okay, so everybody but psych. <laughs> okay, so psych is the odd man out. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick. Good afternoon. Yeah, um, you got a question. Yes, uh, it's kind of just a personal guidance question. Um, I'm coming from out of state, uh, but I am licensed in, as an LSSP and I have my doctorate in school psychology. So eventually I would like to become a licensed psychologist and I'm not sure if I am able to get supervision during my full-time job as an LSSP, if that would count toward a licensed psychology uh, certificate. Uh, did you do an internship in your, uh, in your yes, doctoral but, program? 
yes, it was a school psych internship, so it was in a school. Okay, was it supervised by a psychologist? She actually is a licensed psychologist, but I don't think she got the license till after my internship, but she was a doctoral level. Okay, so that, that, that'll be a, that's one problem that I can see right out of the gate. It's gonna be problematic for you getting licensed. Um, I, um, the, yeah, to, to answer your question, what you originally asked, uh, can, you, can you do supervision while working as an LSSP? Yeah, I think you can. I, th I think 463.11 actually speaks to, um, Patrick, correct me, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't that talk about you can use the experience that you've accrued under the, under the title of like LPA or LSSP uh, towards that to satisfy like your postdoc? I think as long as you're as a, the supervisor is a licensed psychologist, yes. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. So and I, then, I, I think that's probably doable for you. It's the internship thing is what I see is going to be your biggest problem. So would I still would need an internship? I couldn't just get supervised hours now? No. Okay. No. And, and let me tell you, here, here's another... I would really encourage you to watch the psychology board meeting on November 4th, because this is going to be a topic that they're going to tackle. They've actually got a rule that's been proposed to try and address situations similar to what you're, you're telling me about. Um, I, I would really encourage you to watch that. It, it's, it's a rule. The, the rule that's been proposed is designed to allow people to cure deficiencies uh, when they don't meet certain licensing requirements. Now, the fact that you don't have an internship that that's not going to be able to be cured uh that's mm -hmm. that even under this rule that's been proposed you would have you would have to have an internship the whether that internship meets the requirements of the rules that component of it under this rule might be able to be cured but i, I don't know what the future of that rule is to be honest with you because i know it's going to be hotly contested at that meeting um yeah. Is that, super, is that internship still required for the um, associates? No, an in, a formal internship is not, but you do have to have six semester credit hours of some form of supervised, structured, supervised experience to be an LPA. Okay, so I could maybe pursue that first, the LPA, and then... Well, the problem um, is, is you, it would have to be supervised by a, a licensed psychologist within your degree program. So unless you, if you didn't have any psychologist supervising you when you earn your doctoral degree, you're, you're going to run into almost the same problem there. Okay. And so it would have to be within a program, not just me working and paying for supervision. Right. Right. That's correct. Now I'll, I'll tell you again, that's, I, I don't, I'm not trying to not answer your question and push you to that meeting, but that's one of the things that uh, I think is going to be talked about is, if that rule for psychology is adopted or recommended for adoption, I think the board is also going to look at whether or not they want to extend that same type of cure uh, remedy to LPAs as well. So um, you're gonna, you really just need to watch the meeting and, and watch the debate because I really I don't know what to tell you how that's going to come out. Okay, thank you. I'll put that on my calendar. You bet. Uh, Mr. Center, you have a question for us? I do. I'm preparing my response to the, um, the proposed LPC board rules related to supervisors and uh, supervisees, and specifically whether or not the uh, LPAs can practice independently. But before I do my response, I want to make sure I understand, you know, what is this problem or what is this solution proposed for? What's, what problem exists? that necessitate this change to the board rules? Well, the, the, the rule change came about because of a petition for rulemaking filed by an individual on, on behalf of the state association that represents LPC associates. So that's what, that's what it came out of. They, you know, they had identified several problems with supervision. Okay, so this, this is the perception that there's a problem with the existing LPA's ability to operate and so being able to operate independently would cure that problem? 
Are we wait? Are we talking about LPAs or LPC associates? That's what I'm talking about. LPC associates. Okay. Okay. So state your question again, sir. So again, related to the LPC associates, the the proposed board rule is that they be allowed to practice independently and to no, no, that's that's not what the rule is. The rule only the rule only states that they can uh, it would allow them to own a business. They cannot practice independently. They have to be under supervision. Nothing. The rule doesn't change any aspect of that. They they ha, they must be under supervision. But then, but they can now own their own business if that rule is adopted. And then they can serve. They can have the records or possession of the records of the client instead of, as currently exists, it's for the organization that they work for. I think that's right, uh, yeah. Patrick. Yeah. If they if they if they're up opening their own brick and mortar shop and they're receiving supervision, they would probably be the ones that would be retaining the records as opposed to the supervisor holding the records, but they would still need uh, uh, to be under supervision. Right. Well, I just want to make sure I understood the reason for this before I respond, because it this, there's a, a lot, of, I've been a supervisor and a counselor educator for years, and I just, I'm trying to understand what problem exists that this is going to solve and the only thing i see this is creating more problems but i'll address that in my response i think a lot of it arose out of um based upon the testimony that we've seen and the the comments we received uh that, that kind of kicked this off was there were a lot of there were instances of exploitation of supervisors on supervisees um there were maybe instances of not so great supervisor or supervision being provided. And um, uh, I guess the best way is just kind of some exploitative conduct that was taking place on supervisees. And they, the, the individuals that petitioned for this rule change felt like, well, if we could own our own business, that would remove one avenue of the exploitation. Uh, that is occurring and we would kind of be responsible for we, we'd almost have like an eat eat what you kill type thing rather than having to work for somebody and accept the terms that they they dictate as far as the business relationship goes now i will say what the rule does not do is require supervisors to provide supervision to somebody who owns their own brick and mortar you still have the option as a supervisor to say well i'm not going to do that i'm only going to supervise folks who work for me uh, so we haven't mandated it. Uh, it's just an option. If you're a supervisor, you can choose to do it or you can choose not to. It's, it's totally up to you. Right, thanks. For, I just wanted to understand the rationale for doing this to begin with. But thank sure. you. Ms. Richter, do you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Um, so I'm a licensed psychologist. And with the new um, two-year renewal versus the one-year, I know when I had my sex offender license, CSOT required us to get half one year and half the other year. Is that how it is for us now? Or can we do all 40 at one you, time? Really you, can do, you can do all 40 at any point during that two-year renewal cycle. We don't care if it's, you don't have to spread it out or break it down halfway between one year and the other. Just as long as it occurs within that two-year renewal period, you're fine. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. You bet. And I know some other people have asked, I want to go ahead and touch on this now. A lot of people have asked, well, how much of that human trafficking training, how many hours do we take? We really don't say hours. I mean, the law just says you have to complete the course. I don't, I don't really care how many hours it is. Uh, as long as you complete it, that way you can check it off and say, hey, we did it. So don't worry about, oh, my gosh, I only took a one-hour course. Are they requiring three? No, we're not. Uh, as long as you say that you took the course, that's all we're looking for. So uh, th that was all I wanted to throw out there. Sarah, did you have something? I, I couldn't tell if I spoke over you there. No, okay. I was just agreeing with you. Okay. All right. Uh, it's Rapsy Van Buren. Do you have a question for us? Oops. Yes, I do. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Uh, so I have I have circled on my calendar the November 4th. I see that as coming up. And I also kind of paid attention when you navigated um, specific board um, contact. However, I'm a military spouse that have very unique issues from like coming from a different state 
to now and had recently graduated. So I just wanted to know if there was, because it's like a hundred full and I'm conscious of everybody's time, if there was a point of contact person that could help with military spouse or military service members specific questions outside of this forum. No, we don't, we don't have a single point of contact for that. Uh, what I would recommend is uh, when you send your email in, you just need to indicate, hey, I'm military spouse, you know, what your question is, and then we can, we can direct it internally uh, to an individual that can answer that question. But no, we don't have anything listed on the website as a single point. The reason, I'll just tell you all, the reason we had to move away from, you know, listing email addresses on the website is because it got, it, it got too unworkable. I mean, people were CCing every email address we had, despite us telling them don't do that. And it was causing a massive amount of work, uh, untangling everything. So we've had to do away with that and create, operate off this web-based form that now it, it kind of controls how the emails are dissected. And then we can then distribute it internally much easier than me answering a question and only to have Sarah and Christina uh, you know, answer the same thing or wonder who, if anybody answered this thing. So, um, you know, no, we don't have a single point of contact. I'm sorry. That's, a, that's so unfortunate, but I understand. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I could see even with the psych issue for us is that when you're talking about supervised hours post um, your degree, we never really stay in the same spot. So case an example, I was five months into my supervision and then again through my spouse getting relocated here it starts back at zero and it has within this last two years prevented me from practicing completely um from just trying to go through this board and you know again trying to settle down and as military spouse i can say i was completely going to abandon this um i have a whole basket of rocks you were talking about to throw Add. And we <laughs> to abandon this completely because then I would say, okay, two years, you get a board that is not really understanding or compliant, then we move. And then this, of course, the military guards are humorous. So we get re restationed here for another two years. So I go like, great. So I have Texas to deal with again. So just need a point of person who can give some kind of clarity and have us practice. So I'm in that circle. Yeah. The best thing to do is, is direct your question to the psych uh, program there, and that way we can we can get it answered for you. Uh, let me ask you, are you licensed in another jurisdiction? I was temporarily licensed. So after I finished temporary. my degree, temporarily licensed, and then I called prior to here and said, hey, I'm moving because of a military spouse. And now in hindsight, I realized a receptionist said, um, advised me, she said, like, there's no reciprocity with Texas, and you'd have to relinquish that license. Well, that's what I did. And I came here and then I realized there's no equivalent. And that, again, it's been two years just circling, unable to practice. So my case is very unique. I understand that. But um, it, it, it does pose, I know it's not unique to military spouses. So while the general public, it probably is, it's, we just have to pick up and move where they send us. I, I don't, I don't know that you know, I don't know that you're prohibited from to from completely aggregating hours. In other words, if you've accrued hours in another jurisdiction under a supervisor and you move here, I don't think you're, com I think you're allowed some aggregation uh, under psych rules. So I would, I, I don't know that that's accurate if you're saying you can't aggregate. Now, Tim, on the, the military, the three-year military spouse license we issue, is that they, they have to be licensed in another jurisdiction before they get that? Does it have okay. to be independently yeah. licensed or temporarily? No, it's all, this is all, I think, based on permanent licensure, or full licensure, wow. not temporary licensure. Um, so, I, I, yeah, that's all a statutory problem there. That's not a regulatory problem. That's by statute is the way that stuff is set up to work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're, you're kind of, you're going to be caught in a tough spot. I mean, I can just tell right now. Two years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't think you're completely cut out from aggregating if you've got some hours uh from another supervisor i think you may be able to use it as long as it's not too old so hmm. okay thank you you bet you bet okay miss dimerson or dimerson do you have a question for us 
Yes, I do. Um, I had a question about um, supervising in terms of an LPC uh, supervisor. And on Chapter 681, Subchapter C, 681.92, under the experience requirements, it only states that they need to have four hours per month of supervision, but it doesn't state what type of modality that will be approved by, such as in person, um, telephonic, would that count? Um, it may be virtual, such as Zoom. Do you know what type of modalities are being accepted at this time? Christina, I think, I think I think all of them are. I don't. Yeah, the only the only limit is the group supervision. You know, a fifty percent can't be by group, but that's the only limit that the rule put, puts on it. I don't think there's any difference between whether or not it's in person or by Zoom. If that's if that's what you're talking about. Yes, that is correct. And the board changed that. Um, I think in 2017, um, they they went away from that and to make it more accessible for the supervisors and supervisees. Okay, great. I didn't realize telephonic only was also changed. Okay, and then the last question. I, I, will, is... I will add one thing. Ms. I, 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 now, anything the methodology you choose, it needs to be, it needs to be appropriate for the type of care that your supervisee is delivering. It needs to be appropriate for that particular supervisee. So, I wouldn't just say you can do telephonic across the board um, if you've got an, you know, particular patient or client or a supervisee who that's probably not the best way to go for. You need to have eyes on them. Um, there's going to be some reasonable limitations there, yeah. but it, it is it is an option on the table, though. Absolutely. Um, and um, let's see here. And then the second question is with regards to documentation. I know you know depending on which um, insurance panel you're on, there's different requirements as to what they require for their documentation, progress notes, etc. Is there anything like that that I didn't find anything like that under the TAC um, as far as what's required for documentation, documentation of you know sessions or notes for counseling? I'm not aware of any kind of requirement like that. You're talking specifically for like a billing requirement, I guess. Is that is that really more what it's addressing? Supervision so session. I, Right, for supervision sessions. So for example, some, you know, MCOs will require that you you know, that you document the progress, lack of progress, along with diagnosis, along with, you know, it's just all these different things in a session, um, what modality was used. So I was just wondering if maybe BHEC had something like that. I just couldn't find anything, but I just was wondering. I mean, there, there's some requirements for LPCs in 681.93. That details a lot of the the requirements that you have to keep as the supervisor. That's that's the only rule that I'm aware of. BHEC certainly right. not going to have a rule like that, but the LPC board has that rule. All righty. Thank you. You bet. Ms. Kimball, did you have a question for us? I do. I'm confused about, so I'm an associate. Okay. And I, so I'm pretty fresh out of school. So in the ethics that I was taught was I, because I'm not allowed to be on an insurance panel, I cannot receive payment from an insurance company, even if it's through my boss or supervisor, you know, an owner of a facility or um, another therapist, right? So an, a full blown LPC has a number on a panel, right? And the way I understand it, and please give me some clarification, is as an associate, I cannot have my boss bill for my service under their number. That was what I was taught. However, there are insurance companies that will pay that way and organizations that function that way. And so that would be an inconsistency. Right? Is it allowed or isn't it allowed? Hi, hey, Patrick. That would, that would really be a billing question for that particular insurance provider. So we wouldn't dictate, however, Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield or some other you know, uh, insurance provider, Humana, would, would allow you to bill uh, those particular services and how they impanel those licensees. We're really only focused on the licensing of, of those particular uh, persons and if there's any particular billing irregularities or fraud. So if you have 
uh, if, you're, if a supervisor has a contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield that says you have to bill, uh, you have to bill people these particular ways, and they they don't do it, or they 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 submit you know bills to those insurance companies for that don't comply with that, or they're hiding something from it. That would be a potential violation, but we wouldn't get into the weeds about can you can you bill it this way or that way. That's a that's something that either if you're participating in Medicare, or Medicaid, or a third party payer. Uh, and it's it's in between that agreement between the uh, provider and the insurance company, uh, and as long as you're complying with that, uh, I don't know that we would get involved with it. It's it's really just when you violate that agreement. Um, that's so, Patrick, if I just am an associate and I'm not privy to seeing that contract, and yet I'm you know I'm working and and I get paid, but the owners getting paid from the insurance company. I don't have any idea how that's being billed. And then all of a sudden the insurance company says, wait a minute, this is fraud. Am I liable in any way because I receive funds as an associate? Well, I don't know that we could, I could fully answer that question without fully fleshing out all the facts of the particular case. But if essentially your supervisor is telling you one thing, but doing something different and you have no participation in that particular defrauding of the insurance company, that would be facts that would come out if there was ever a, a regulatory action against your license that we would look at and say to help determine whether or not you had participated in the fraud or not. And so if it looked like everything, everything was being hidden from you, it would most likely not be an issue. The, the issue the, with us, the issue is, is would, it, would the insurance company not have a problem with it or would it violate a particular criminal statute? I don't, I can't answer that question because that's beyond our jurisdiction. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to make that determination. So as everything goes corporate, right, and there's all these facilities that the associates have to work for and we're not informed, and there's this possibility of exposure, this concerns me, you know, so because it would, if it went criminal, there would be, the associate would have to go to court. You're, you're worried about culpability for somebody else basically committing insurance fraud. That's what yes. you're worried about. Yeah, right. and because it's it seems to be like a standard practice in certain, you know, uh, in at certain facilities, and I and I hate to say anything, but <laughs> because you know, um, I'm one of those associates who wants to have their own business. So, <laughs> but yeah. um, you know, it just it's so confusing. It is so confusing. And mind you, I'm telling you, it is not my supervisor. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the corporate. Um, facilities that they're corporately owned that's more what i'm talking about yeah. um okay and i have one more question in pardon my in ignorance but i was at the BHEC meeting and dr taylor said that the issue of the associates going on their own uh, ownership is on the register so when it's on the register and i love that flow chart that you showed so it's on the register it's for public comment which closes on sunday and then it goes then what happens to it, it goes back to the lpc board at their november 12th meeting okay and is there a decision made then or it well, bounces out again well, like in the flow chart, the, the LPC board will then decide whether to recommend to the council adoption of that rule or withdrawal of the rule. In other words, they'll, they'll give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. BHEC's going to look to them and go, what do y'all want? Do you want, it, you want us to adopt it? You don't want to adopt it? Um, so that, that's how it'll go. So it'll go to that LPC board. They'll give a recommendation. Then when the council meets in February, I think it's February 1st, that's when it would, if the LPC board says, yes, adopt it, it would be formally adopted, assuming the BHEC goes along with it, which again, I, I can't imagine the council, you know, not yeah. going along with a recommendation from the member board on something like that. But yeah, assuming the council adopts it, then it would be adopted at the February 1st meeting and it would become law after that. Oh, good. Okay. And for that gentleman that called, I'll just give an example. Last month, I couldn't take any payment because I'm not, I wasn't working in a facility that would accept my payment, okay? So I had to do everything for free as an associate Yeah. because I left an office where they smoked and I 
I didn't think that was healthy. So I like to have those choices. Or if someone was doing this insurance stuff and I don't want to work there, I should be able to move around freely as an associate. I also well, had a question about that's that's why you need to give the that's why you need to make your your positions known through public. I call did. Okay. I did. Um, so on coaching, which is so unregulated and doing whatever, coaching can go across any state line. Is that is that correct? So I'm not aware of coaching being regulated in any jurisdiction. But but we as LPCs who are licensed cannot cross state lines, but but coaches can. Right, because LPC counseling is a regulated profession. Mm -hmm. Each each state has chosen to regulate counseling. I don't know of any state that has chosen to regulate coaching or even define what coaching really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You get into whole, there, there again, a whole host slam. of First Amendment problems there. Yeah, yeah. So we're slammed. So this license compact that you mentioned, is that like a reciprocal a state reciprocation? Like if I move to Florida, they'll give me my license based on my record in Texas? Depending on how the compact is structured, you might not even have to get a license in Florida. Once you hold a license in a compact member, you can then practice within the compact itself. You know, every state that's a member of it, you could just practice within that compact. Compacts work differently. Like SIPAC, for example, it's once you've got the authority to practice in SIPAC, you can practice telehealth within it freely, move about telehealth freely. Okay. If you want to practice in person, you can only do it with it, you know, you're limited to 30 days uh, in a state and before you have to stop and go back to your home state or begin doing telehealth. Uh, okay. Different compacts handle it different ways, you know. Uh, okay. I, can't I can't really talk to you about how social work is looking at it right now because that's we're still on kind of the, we're still debating that, how it's going to look. Okay. And, and so is that a separate organization or we can get familiar with it on, on the LPC board's webpage? No, what you need to do is go to the council of state governments um, or look up LPC uh, licensure compact. Christina, can you just yeah, find think, the link real quick? I think quick if and... you just go to Google and you type in uh, counseling compact or LPC counseling compact, it comes up. Oh, perfect. Yeah. And okay. also yeah. we'll, we'll just touch on it at the uh, November 12th meeting as well. Perfect. Yeah, okay. I would just encourage you to read it. It's not, it's not really that long of a document to read. It's, it's, it's full of legalese, but it's, it's certainly, certainly doable. Yeah, I, I, I applaud you guys because everything I read on the, on the web page is full of legal ease. But here's where you guys really have shown improvement. I had a supervisor whose um, license expired and I had a caseload. So I emailed over an urgent message that I needed to switch supervisors with a sign form. And by Monday, I learned it on Friday. And by Monday, I had my new supervisor on board and I could see my clients. So Thank you for protecting the associates and the public too. So mm -hmm. you're doing a great job on that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Ms. Stobner May. Hi, I'm Diane Stobner May, and I'm a licensed psychologist involved in the training of doctoral level um, interns. And my question is regarding the proposed rule change related to supervised experience required for the licensure at, um, of psychologist. Uh -huh. And um, perhaps there is a space that explains this rationale, rationale uh, but as I've been um, communicating and with my colleagues, particularly in training, there was a, a lot of difficulty in us trying to just understand what the rationale for this rule was. Many of us um, have, you know, a, a 2000 hour internship, um, which is basically the, is the equivalent of one year full time. And, you know, a lot of work and effort to make that a meaningful training experience and that it's sequential um, has been, you know, invested in training people so that they are competent to go out and be independent as a psychologist. And so I, I don't know if, if there's 
you know, again, I, I just couldn't find anything and it doesn't seem like any of my colleagues understand um, the rationale of this proposed change. And so I, I didn't know if anybody maybe could either speak to that or perhaps even like point me in a direction where I might find some more information. I would, I would strongly encourage you to watch the actual TSBEP board meetings, the past two or three, at least the past two meetings okay. uh, where this rule was discussed because we talk extensively about the reason. Yeah. The rationale behind the rule. I, I will say, I want to, I want to clarify something about the rule. I've, I've read a lot of comments and heard a lot of things about what people are saying about the proposed rule. There seems to be kind of a rumor going around that that rule would eliminate the requirement for an internship. And that is absolutely not true. Uh, right, and, and I've seen some of that floating around too, and, and just let me say, you know, uh, myself and some other training directors, you know, had considered writing a letter, and then there was a hesitation because there's not clarity regarding what the actual issue is right now, and so it seems really hard to put together something when we're not sure what we're addressing, but like I hear you now that um, hearing the information that was disseminated in the board meeting yeah. would be helpful in understanding the, the rationale. Yeah, I, I sort of say, Diane, in the past two, isn't that where they got into the big debates on it? It, it may even go back to three or four uh, board meetings ago. I know, the, I know the past two were pretty, uh, they had some pretty heavy debate on it. Is there, I know it sounds like it's, that's um, a lot, but, could you maybe, is there a, a quick summary? You the cliff or, notes? Or, yeah, is there a cliff note version? Yeah, um, yeah. What, what brought this about was we, we had an applicant who uh, had applied with us and she, she came from a doctoral program that did not, I don't think it included an internship in the degree program. Uh, and then the internship, I don't also did not have two interns in it or, and it only had one supervisor. So she has, she has internship hours. It's just they are post they were post conferral of the degree hours. Now yeah. that's, that's problematic under the current rules because the current rules require you to have a, a formal internship within your degree program. Prior to 2016 or 2017 though, that wasn't the case. We actually accepted, we call them colloquially as roll your own internships. Okay. Uh, they were internships that could, Back then, a long time ago, we used to accept internships that occurred after the doctoral program. Uh, so this rule kind of takes us back in time to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, what, what happened was this particular individual, um, I don't know that anybody can in good faith say, I, haven't, I didn't hear any of the board members just say, uh, and really challenge and say to her face, hey, you're not qualified. Uh, but she she clearly does not meet the requirement of having two interns and two supervisors in her internship. In, Diane, in that the those yeah. are the two big hangups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes is is that enough to, you know, if if once upon a time we accepted the the postdoc uh, internship, um, you know, is there any real is it does anybody have any legitimate good faith concerns that this individual is not competent and what that did is that kind of exposed it exposed the discussion or the the debate of well is this rule is this rule really i mean what would her what would her option be without this rule mm -hmm. i mean she she literally has to go back and either get a new doctoral degree or go through a respecialization program is that a fair outcome based upon how close she is, or, or is there something that maybe we could do to say, well, look, if you jump through these extra hoops, uh, that will then kind of close the gap on, uh, you know, the, the training and education that we think is necessary to turn you loose on the public to practice independently. The problem is, is without this type of rule, the board doesn't have a mechanism to make that kind of assessment. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people view this rule as, oh, it's going to be an automatic waiver or an automatic uh, modification. And it's not. It's based upon the board's judgment as to whether or not to grant those things. Now, you know, the flip side to that argument is, well, is it going to be, you know, if you get the board in there and they just start rubber stamping stuff, does the exception swallow the rule? I get that argument. That, that's something that, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to have to debate. But the, the, where the rubber meets the road is, is you, you look at applicants, and not just this applicant, but really other applicants in the past that we've denied, 
um, over similar type things is, is it really fair to be denying somebody when they're really, really close and their only option because they didn't have two interns or they didn't have two supervisors is to say, go back and get a new doctoral degree or go do a re-specialization degree. Uh, is that fair? And, you know, uh, one thing Governor Abbott has instructed us to do is to review our rules and make sure we're not putting onerous burdens or being unreasonable in the burdens we set for entry into the profession. I mean, everybody acknowledges we've got a workforce shortage of mental health. So are we, you know, are we really jeopardizing the public if we let this person who was pretty close, I'll admit, not there, uh, they're not qualified under our existing rules, but they're close. Are we, are we jeopardizing the public um, by letting her in, you know, uh, to be a provider? And that's kind of the debate they're having. Thank you. So, yeah, for whatever it's worth, there it is. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Oh, Lauren, I'm going to butcher your, I'm just going to say, Lauren, what's your question? <laughs> Afraid I don't, I won't get your name right. Thank you. It's Masharelli. Masharelli. Okay. <laughs> Um, I have two very different questions. Um, one is that it was brought to my attention this week that, um, I guess I should say, I'm an LPC and an LMFT supervisor. Um, it was brought to my attention this week that um, at some point, once we moved over to BHAC or maybe since then, that there was no longer a spreadsheet or a cumulative list available um, or readily available that showed us who had received sanctions or voluntary, uh, voluntarily surrendered their license or had their license revoked. Correct. Um, and that now in order to determine that we need to know which provider we're wanting to look up, search their license and look for that information. Um, I am concerned that that is a burden on both the public and those of us who like to regularly make sure that our referral lists are still licensed and haven't been sanctioned by the board um, in any way. Um, can I get some information about why this change was made and if there's any move to make that list more readily available? Sure, we moved away from that list because we actually include all the agreed orders, the disciplinary orders are in the board packets and in the council packets. So that information is out there. Uh, if people want to look at it. And then candidly, um, it's just a matter of bandwidth. Do we want to, do we want staff to spend their time maintaining and updating a list like that? And I know the natural reaction is you're going to say, well, Daryl, that's only a couple of minutes. Well, minutes add up to hours and add up to days. Um, and honestly, I've just got better uses of staff time than maintaining those types of lists when that same information is out there uh, available through other avenues. So that's why we don't do that. Sure. Um, but I guess uh, my, my counter comment to that is that we have to know that somebody had been sanctioned or that there was a complaint or know that we, we have to know that we need to go look versus having it readily available for all people who've had their license revoked. Um, the example that came up on the Awesome Mental Health Facebook page this week had to do with um, a, a, a licensed practitioner who was uh, voluntarily surrender their license for having being accused of having sex with a client. Mm -hmm. um, and I had absolutely no idea that that person had had those claims filed against them that they had surrendered their license and were now operating as a life coach, um, charging $300 an hour or whatever it is. Um, and so I worry that because it's so much more difficult to find that information now, um, that we have to have the case number or we have to know the licensee's name, that we may make mistakes <laughs> and refer to people who are no longer operating under the confines of our rules. Well, I mean, candidly, you, I, I wouldn't be referring to somebody that I hadn't, that I wasn't familiar enough with. <laughs> that right. would be my recommendation is well. don't, don't <laughs> refer blindly. <laughs> No, so, I'm right. But this person has held leadership positions in our in our world and has was highly regarded. And frankly, none of us knew that this happened. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the reason they know is because it was in the board meeting packets. That's how okay. that particular. So, I mean, it, the message got out there. Okay. It was in it was in those board packets. That's how okay. they learned about it. Okay. Uh, thank you. And then my other question is completely different. Um, Earlier, Sarah spoke about the 500 hours for technology assisted services maximum for LMFT associates. 
Um, and I was just wanting to clarify if there's ever like a, if there's an expiration date. So if they have already in the last 18 months accrued more than 500 hours of technology assisted services, is there a point that the pandemic is no longer gonna be considered a reason for that, that appeal process to take place? Do we need to start instructing our LMFT associates that they have to go back in person if they've already accrued 500 hours via technology assisted services at some point? How do, how do we determine that? So we can't pre-evaluate anyone's experience okay. prior to them submitting an application for upgrade. Okay. At the time that the associate submits for upgrade is the time that staff will receive all that document, uh, all that documentation and assess that particular individual's experience. Okay. Um, the pandemic occurred under, we know of, we, that things kind of shut down about March of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and we have the governor's declared disaster uh, records. He's, he just recently, yesterday, renewed that COVID disaster declaration. So staff has records to, to should someone apply, for example, four years from now with some, uh, some supervision that occurred during this time, um, staff would have record of those two elements, what their supervision experience was reported to be and verified by their supervisor and what the governor's declared thing is. So um, I think you're asking, can the rules change again? And yes, the rules can change again. But right now I can tell you these, what the, these are what the rules are. Okay. Um, does, does that mean that unless the rules change between now and whenever, um, that we need to keep an eye on the governor's COVID disaster declaration. And once that's no longer in place, we need to be more mindful that if they have exceeded those 500 hours already, that they need to go back to in-person services or can you not speak to that at this time? I, I, think, I think yes, and that goes along with um, anyone who's a licensee should keep up with what the rules are and when they change and might need to change their processes to accommodate those rules. Okay. So, I'm sorry, is that helpful at all? It is more helpful. <laughs> Thank not, you. Not, not the answer you probably wanted, but. Uh, <laughs> but that, that I, I like very clear answers and, yeah. and I know it's hard to get those sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I appreciate you guys. You bet. Ms. Jones, you have a question for us? Yes, are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, hi, uh, first of all, thank you so much for putting this on. You, you asked the question at the top of the hour, would this be a waste of anybody's time? And I don't think so, this is awesome. Um, I have, a, I think, a very straightforward, simple question. I had put it in the, in the chat, but or in the Q&A, but I didn't get an answer. I am looking to become a um, certified supervisor, L uh, MFT supervisor. And um, the rules uh, don't necessarily like provide a list of avenues that we can go through. Um, one that it did specify is the AA MFT course, which doesn't really align with my life and schedule right now. But I did find an online course, 40 hour course for LPC LMFT supervisor through Kate Walker. And I'm just wondering, is that indeed approved? If, if, if I spend my $600 and go through this course, will that be sufficient to meet the education requirements to supervise? That appears to satisfy 801.143A1, B as in boy, a 40 hour contingent education course and clinical supervision. Perfect, okay, that's all I, I wanted to confirm. Thank you very much. Ms. Colley, did you have a question for us? Ms. Colley? Yes, yes, I'm here, thank you. Yeah. Um, I am an LPC in Oklahoma and Texas, although I haven't practiced in Texas for many years. 
I'm getting ready to um, probably open an office in the Dallas area for just seeing clients a couple of days a week when I'm down there um, um, to check on an elderly parent. So my uh, quick question in that regard is with um, no compact for L LPCs yet, um, and you may have touched on this when I stepped out of the room, I apologize if that's the case. Can I see uh, Texas residents while I'm physically in Oklahoma if I needed to, or could I see Oklahoma residents while I'm physically in Texas, uh, you know, via um, a HIPAA compliant platform? Are, are you, you said you're licensed in both Oklahoma and Texas? Yes. Yeah, you're good to go. Okay, as far as Texas is concerned, right? Right. Okay, and I, then my unrelated question is, um, I have a colleague in Washington State who got licensed 30 years ago and um, plans to move to Texas to start practicing. Does she have to reapply for a, a new license or can she, since there's no reciprocity, is there some other like in-between process that she would go through and would she need to take the substance abuse courses to transfer in um, to practice in Texas? There were no substance abuse courses when she took her original or became an LPC originally. Christine, I'm gonna let you field that one. So she is currently licensed in Texas or um, has it lapsed? She's licensed in Oklahoma and Washington state. But she previously held a Texas license? Uh, no, ma'am. Oh. I answered this one in Q&A actually. Oh, I'm sorry, I did not see that. That's okay. Uh, I think you were talking about the actual coursework, right, for their for her degree. Well, um, I'm I'm not sure the question except that or her question except that she said there were some new requirements that Texas had implemented for substance abuse uh, courses prior to new applicants being approved. And uh, the way I the way I read that, I thought she was or thought you were referring to the uh, change for education from court from education that began in 2017 moving forward, where it included a substance abuse addictions counseling yes. uh, course, right? Yeah. So that's only for people whose education program began in 2017 or later. So she got her education before 2017, so it wouldn't it wouldn't impact her. Perfect. Secondly, okay. Since she's already licensed in another state, if she applies here while she holds that license and has held that license for at least two years, um, her education would be considered to have been to have met all requirements anyway. Okay. So she she wouldn't have an education issue in coming to Texas. So okay. don't don't let her don't let her lapse or expire or retire that other license till she gets the Texas one in her hands. Okay, right. and uh, thank you for that. Um, when we are looking for a um, course uh, for forty hours to become an approved supervisor um, in Texas, um, is there any place I can go to um, find? Um, other than the list that you all post of people that have been approved for that course to provide that training, is there any place you can go to just read about uh, the quality or the, re the ratings, the reviews, or any complaints um, about how do, you, how do you shop around there for a good training course? You might want to talk to Mr. Google. We don't, we don't, we're not like Yelp. We don't have a, a listing of, we don't have like a star review system or something like that for, for these courses. Or you might want to contact your association, perhaps uh, contact your professional um, colleagues uh, and ask around. But um, it's not really within our scope to um, provide information as to uh, the various satisfaction levels yeah. for a particular course we, we can't really you get into the whole business of well you're showing preferential treatment to that one and directing more business our right. way we, we can get into a lot of trouble doing that kind of stuff uh, okay 
So if they have complaints, those would be the only things that would be on your record. Yeah, if the, if the licensee who's providing it had a complaint against them, yeah, you could get that. Okay. Or not the complaint, but a, an order, a disciplinary order. Right, okay. All right. If, well, if they have a disciplinary order, that's going to um, cause their supervisor status to go away, and so they won't be able to provide it anyway. Okay, so. right. All right, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You bet. Ms. Hall, do you have a question for us? Barbara Hall, do you have a question for us? Ms. Hall, going once, going twice. Okay, come back, raise your hand again. Ms. Bourne, did you have a question for us? Wow, I'm not doing so hot here on the end, am I? No, no, are you Oh, there we go. Okay. okay, yeah, all right. This has to do with continuing hours, uh, seminars, webinars, et cetera. Um, as an example, I, I understand, or I've always understood that web, webinars and seminars had to be, like, such as PESI and some of those, they're always conducted by people with, they're either psychologists or, uh, professionals in, in the line of, I'm an LPC. But I took a 60 hour training through one of the, it's called the Stephen Ministry. It was as good as any, any course I've taken anywhere at PSI or, or any of the other places. And I'm wondering, uh, but it was not necessary, it was taught by you know, a lot of the lectures, some of them were by, uh, diff there were different people with different backgrounds. What about something like that? I have a certificate showing that I completed it uh, and I'm involved in the program, et cetera. Um, and I just wonder what the, what the basic uh, thinking is in terms of qualifications for uh, continuing education uh courses and so on I, I think i think you'd have to evaluate that course based on so the lpc rules that you'd want to take a look at are 681.142 which is titled acceptable continued education and 681.143 is titled activities unacceptable as continued education and you can look and see if it matches up or doesn't match up with some of those standards in those particular rules to see if it might be acceptable or not. One four, uh, one four two and one point uh, one four three. Uh, one four two and one and one four three. That's correct. Okay, I have an idea. They probably won't, but I'll tell you, it was as good as any any of those other courses. In fact, better than some because of the interaction and you know practice and and stuff. But but. Um, I'll, I'll take a look at those. Thank you very much. Yeah, say, take, take a look at those rules. They're, they're written in such a way as to be much more inclusionary than exclusionary. Um, they're, not, they're not as damning uh, on, on providers, I don't think, is, is what some people maybe think they are. So take a look at that. I certainly will, because um, my impression's always been that it had to be... Uh, uh, okay, I will. Thank you. Yeah, there's two others you might look look at too. One four one and one four five, which are right around those rules that also pertain to continuing education as well. Ms. Hafford, did you have a question for us? Janae Hafford. Going once, going twice. All right, we'll, we got three phone callers. We'll just run through them real quick. Caller, do you have any questions for us? You can star six to unmute yourself. Okay, 
hearing nothing. Caller, did you have any questions for us? Star six to unmute. Gosh, cat's got everybody's tongue now. Caller, any questions for us? All right. Hearing none. That That is everybody. Um, well, I, I start to say, I'm not going to keep y'all any longer than what we, what we need to, or what we promised we would. Um, I appreciate everybody's uh, patience and attention during this, and I hope that y'all have found it uh, helpful or useful. Like I say, it, when, once we close this out, you'll get a, just a brief two-question survey. It's very easy, very quick. Just let us know what you think if you if you don't mind if you think it stinks then that's fair too uh you're not gonna hurt my feelings christina might cry but you're not gonna hurt my feelings <laughs> um and then like i say we'll you know depending on what the reaction is we'll, we'll think about doing this some more in the future and I, i've seen there's some comments in here about would we think about breaking it up between the board certainly so uh and i'm probably going to take it back and tell the council and board members hey y'all may ought to think about doing this uh if y'all can muster the time to do it they actually have to make a living so it's a little harder to to get them away to do stuff like this but uh anyway with that uh of course you can always reach us through the contact us webpage. so if anybody has any questions you need to follow up feel free to do that but again we appreciate your time and attention on this and we hope it was useful uh you guys have a good weekend thank you all